<laughs> Last week we went through a lot of scripture verses and covered a, a lot in a short amount of time. It was about a half hour. I don't know. It felt like longer because of all the stuff we covered. But um, this week we just got one scripture verse, and it is in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 24, is a scripture verse that I just could not get away from all week. It just kept burning in my heart, and yet I had a hard time figuring out exactly what God wanted to do with it. And so in some ways I come unprepared because I'm just going to share something from my heart today. But this is the scripture verse I want to focus on as focus on as I share it. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus is speaking. It's in red in most of your Bibles. Mine's not a red letter, so it's not. (laughs) Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of God to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And that's the verse I want to focus on. And it goes on to say, The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Hallelujah. Father, I just ask that you help me, Lord, to uh, share from my heart the things that you want me to share. And let, let the words be your words. Let me flow in your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this is such a, a powerful verse. It says that the kernel of wheat has to fall into the ground and die. Otherwise, it remains a single seed. And Jesus here is speaking of his own death. It, if you look just prior to that, it says in verse 23, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of God to be glorified. And Jesus is looking forward to his death and resurrection. And he's realizing that until he dies, that multiplying of the seed is not going to happen. But he realizes that as he dies and he is buried and he goes into the grave for three days and three nights, that when he raises again from the dead, that multiplication is going to come. And we saw it last week where we looked at Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when there was just 120 in the upper room and the power of the Holy Spirit fell and then Peter stands up and he, and he prophesies and he speaks the word of God and suddenly 3,000 people were added to the church that day and, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread and, and many miraculous signs followed and the apostles did many wonderful things and it was because Jesus died and rose from the dead that that was going to happen. And as I, as I think about the fact that the kernel of wheat has to fall into the ground and die, and I realize that in our own lives we have to die. We have to die to ourselves. We have to die to our ambitions. We have to die to, to our thoughts. We have to die to, to our desires and, and let the desire of God come into us and transform us and, and make us into something that we could never be if we didn't have that death. That's why water baptism is so important, that showing that we are dying to our old self and that we are coming up anew, that, that as we go underneath the water, we are saying we're dead to who we used to be and we are rising again in newness of life. I remember a, a song that a contemporary Christian band had many, many years ago back in the 80s, and, and uh, it was um, killing my old man. And some people thought, well, this is a horrible thing. You're going to go kill your dad. No, it wasn't talking about your father. It was talking about my old way of life, talking about who I used to be, letting that part die so that I could rise again in newness and in life. And, and, and as I think about, you know, flowing in the Spirit and, and letting God's Spirit speak in this place, and, and, and we saw God move in a powerful way last week. We, uh, I was able to flow in the Spirit in a powerful way. The anointing was here. I think we all uh, acknowledge that and, and testify to that. And, and when you see that and you experience that, and, and, and when I can demonstrate that, I want you to know that that is something that is available for each and every one of you. And that flowing in the Spirit is something that we should all have throughout our daily lives. 
and, and to testify to you that although I am able to flow in the Spirit in a powerful way when I'm preaching and, and teaching, when it comes to my everyday life, I struggle with that flowing in the Spirit in, in those areas. And so even though it may look easy and it may look like it's something that I've mastered, it's not something that I have mastered. It's something that I still struggle with. It's something that I still have to, every day, um, submit myself to the power of God as I, as I walk with my family, you know, as a father, as a husband. Uh, it's something I struggle with, you know, flowing in the spirit. It's so easy to let the flesh come in. It's so easy to say things or do things that are not glorifying to God. And, and it's something that I struggle with just as much as every one of you has. And as a matter of fact, there's probably some of you that flow in your spirit better when you're outside the doors of this place than I do. Even though you may see me flowing in here in a special way, uh, I struggle with it when I'm out there. And I want you to know that, and I want you to to understand that and, and have that as a word of encouragement. Uh, no, it's not something where, oh, wow, I wish I could be like him. It's something where we're all working together to, to be uh, and to glorify God. It, you know, the Bible talks about there's, there's some that are young men, there's some that are old men, there's some that are, that are, that are young adults. And, and in all of our lives, there's areas where we're mature, there's areas where we're immature. And, and just because somebody's mature in one area of their life doesn't mean that they're not immature in other areas in their life. And, and it's something that we all grow in and we all celebrate. And I, and I hear an amen, sister. Yeah, amen. I hear. <laughs> Praise God. And, and so, you know, uh, one of the things I think about when I, when I think about that and the power of the God and the power of the Spirit that, that can be there when I'm preaching and teaching is you know, I, I have had sermons and I have... Uh, ministered at the altar time where people have given their lives to the Lord, where people have been filled with the Holy Spirit, where there's been healings. Uh, I've experienced all those things at the altar time. But when it comes to my everyday life, I have never had a time where I've personally led somebody to the Lord. And, and, and that's a shameful thing for me to, to say that even though uh, people have looked at my life and they've seen God in my life and they've been encouraged uh, I've sometimes wondered how they could see God in my life because, you know, I've dealt with those things like depression and I've dealt with things of, of sin. I've, I've dealt with things in, in my everyday life that, that are not glorifying to God. And I go, you know, how do you see God in me? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm human and I'm dealing with the flesh. And I go, man, you know. And, and uh, I had someone at work. Uh, some time back talked about how they, they saw me as such an enthusiastic and, ex, and excited person to be there. And I thought, man, I'm just down in the dumps all the time. What are you talking about, you know? <laughs> and they saw something I didn't see. And, and, uh, and I want you to know that, and I want that to be uh, a word of testimony to you to let you know that, hey, um, just because you see me flowing in the Spirit here, in this place, and just because you see the power of God move mightily uh, at the altar time, there's still areas that I got to grow, and I want to grow in, and, and I confess to you that I need to grow in, and, and 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 I wish I could stand here and tell you that I've led thousands of people to the Lord out there, but the the only times that I've seen people come to the Lord is up here. Uh, I wish I could tell you that there's been thousands of times where I've prayed for people out there and seen healing, but most of the time that I've seen healing, it's been in here up at, a, at an altar time. Uh, that, that most of the time, you know, praying for someone to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I'd love to be able to do that in just my everyday daily life. But the times that I've seen it do it is during the public time and during, during worship time, during the, the, the altar time. And, and so I want to grow in those areas. And one of the ways to grow is to die and to be open and to be honest and say, hey, I've failed in some of those areas. I could do better. I could do better. And, and, and as I think about that and as, as I think about the, the need to do better, I, I'm brought back many years ago, over 20 years ago, to um, when I was a teenager. And I had a very good friend uh, by the name of Ken. And uh, we kind of grew up together in the world uh, is before I knew the Lord and uh, and I was uh, caught up in doing um, drugs and alcohol 
um, playing Dungeons and Dragons, these things, and he was my best friend in those areas uh, of uh, activities uh, where we, we did drugs together, we, we smoked pot together all the time, we played Dungeons and Dragons together, we drank together, we fellowshiped together. He was, he was my best friend, um, and he was someone that, that I really enjoyed spending time with. He was a very intelligent individual, and, uh, and I enjoyed his intellect and, and, and his presence in my life. And then when I turned 18 and I, and I gave my life to the Lord, I, I was at, my parents were going to a Pentecostal church, and the power of God would flow so powerfully in that church. The, the experience of the Spirit was so powerful that I couldn't deny that God was real. I had been brought up in the Catholic Church. I had been brought up with plenty of religion around me. And I had seen religion. And I had seen the form of godliness, but the dying, the power thereof in the services. And, and I went to church regularly as a child in, in the Catholic Church. And there was a form of godliness. It looked like God. I mean, the big, beautiful buildings and the stained glass windows and the altar and the, and the priest and their flowing robes, and they took the incense and they'd walk down and they had the incense burn. It looked like God, but there was no power. There was no power of God there, and, and, and there was no presence of God. There was a teaching about God, and there was an understanding of who God was. The Trinity was taught very strongly. The, the sacrifice that Jesus made, you can see the stations of the cross, uh, around the, the, the building where you'd see Jesus carrying the cross, you'd see Jesus crucified. Uh, they had Jesus up there every day when you went to the service. You saw the crucifixion of Jesus. And, and I remember going to some of the, the, the different um, places where they would have things like crucifixes and things like that. And I, and I remember marveling at, at, at the, the image of Jesus on the cross, how battered they'd have his body and how bruised. And I thought, wow, you know, what, what a powerful death. But the power of God wasn't there. And, and then my parents switched, and they, and they went to, to a Pentecostal church, and all of a sudden now I experienced the power of God and not just the form of godliness. Uh, I experienced the reality of who God was, and, and the Spirit would flow so powerfully in the services, and there would be tongues and interpretation of tongues. There would be prophecies. And, and the thing is, when those things were done, God would speak directly to my heart. And he was revealing and he was uncovering who I was. And he said things that only he could know about me. And he spoke directly to me and not just to my mind, not just to my flesh, but he spoke to my spirit. And as he spoke in those services through tongues and interpretation of tongues, through prophecy, through the sermons as well, I would say, man, this God is real. He, he's real and he's alive and, and he's in this place and, and I couldn't deny the reality of God because of the power of God flowing in that place. And as, and as I came to a point where I couldn't deny that God existed, I also understood the message that he was speaking and he was speaking of love for me. He was speaking that he died on the cross for me. He, he, he was saying to me that I could die to myself and that I could experience a new right. life. He, he was saying to me that he wanted me yeah. in his presence. You tell it, brother. He was saying to me yeah. that, that, he, that he wanted to let me have eternal life. Yeah. Yes, glory. And as that reality came in and as I understood who he was and I understood his love, I said, God, you could do so much better. God, God, you could do so much better than me. Why do you want me? But he wouldn't let me go. He said, I want you yeah, to be God, right? my child. And, and whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and whosoever, he gives the power to be a child of God. And so I surrendered myself. And I said, okay, God. Okay, God. Okay, God. You're real. You're real. God, you love me. God, I want to be your child. And, and I surrendered to him. And, and, and he came into my life with the power of his spirit, and he came into my life in a powerful, powerful way. I got to where I was, you know, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit in, immediately after that, and speaking in tongues and prophesying all the time and just wanting to move forward with the power of God. I wanted to be a powerful, 
faithful person to God. I, I wanted to walk out with that spirit and reality that I just yes. experienced. Yes. And I wanted to share it with others. And I, and I was on fire yes. for God. And I, and I was on fire with the power of God in my life. Yes. And then I experienced the church. And I, and I experienced the way people within the church reacted to God. And I found out that oftentimes, even in a even in a, in a spirit-filled church, even in a place where the power of God moved, that people tended to take God for granted, hold back, say, you know, you, you don't get so excited. They would see someone like me who was a new convert all excited about God and say, you know, he'll calm down as time goes by. God help us. God help us. Why would we want to do that to someone that's new in the Lord and say, calm down. Take it easy. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. What kind of nonsense is that? Oh, God help us. God, let let us learn from those that are fresh in the spirit of God and experience newness. And, and let us renew our first love and come back to that power and that experience. And it was confusing to me to be in a place where the power of God could flow, where I was like, this God is so real. He's great. He loves us. He wants to share that with other people and, and wanting to do that. And yet looking around me and seeing people that were just, some of them, cold, some of them miserable, some of them just no excitement, no, no, no enthusiasm, no, no desire to share that love with others. And yeah, yeah, because we have to die. Oh, John, the scripture verse is John chapter 12, verse uh, 24. <laughs> it's just one verse today. We're keeping, we're keeping it easy on you. And, uh, yeah, having that death to, to self, having that death to, to religion. And, and it was amazing to me to actually see that there was religion in a place where the Holy Spirit flowed. And, you know, religion kills. Religion takes away from God. Yeah. It's relationship that's so important. Right. Hungering for that relationship. And, and, and one of the things that they started talking about was all the don'ts. And, you know, you don't do this, and you don't do that, and you don't do this, and you don't do that. Uh, yeah, and, and instead of helping me to grow in the Spirit and teaching me about this intimate relationship I could have with God, they started talking about the do's and the don'ts. And hellfire preachers that try to scare you in the church. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've talked about the love, you know, where it says God is love. You know, they want to scare you in the church. Scare you in. And we need to have a balance. Yeah. There is hellfire and brimstone oh, yeah. to face. Yeah. There is appointed on the man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Mm -hmm. But there is a love of God that is so powerful and real, and he doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to face hellfire. He wants us all to experience eternal life. Every one of us. Yes. Even the most wicked sinner he wants yes. to yeah. experience power and life. And uh, and so as as I looked at that and as I gave my heart to the Lord and as I was excited about about the realities of God, it it changed my relationship with the friends I had, you know, because I was hanging out with the drug crowd. I was hanging out with the people that that smoked pot and drank and and did those things. I was I was sexually active with my girlfriend and and these things. And I started to try to change and and do the don'ts. Or you know, don't do the don'ts. <laughs> do the do's, and 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 learn those things. But I learned it more as a religion. I learned it more as uh, a list of things that I couldn't do and a list of things I could do. And it became a burden at times for me. And even though there was that excitement there, even though there was a joy, even though there was a desire to please God, I forgot that I was pleasing to Him even while I was dead in my sins. Yes. I, I forgot that, that he called me a child and he called me out even while I was deep in my trespasses. And even when I was in, in the worst place, he loved me. And, and I, I forgot that. 
and, and, and thought that I had to earn it, thought that I had to, you know, follow the list, thought that I had to check it off and make sure it was good. And so even though there was that desire there, it, it became somewhat of a burden for me. And I, you know, and I, and I sat down with my girlfriend and told her, hey, you know, we can't be sexually active anymore. This is just, it's, it's not right. And, and, you know, started to break away from some of my friends and, 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 and shy away from those things and trying to walk in, in a way that was pleasing to God. And, and because the excitement was there, because the love of God was there, because the reality of who God was was, was there, I was able to break away from some of those things and able to, to walk in, in a way that was pleasing. But then the tides of life came in and the, the burdens of life and, and the desire for the flesh to still be alive. And I didn't let the flesh die the way I should have. And I went back to some of those things. Went back to some of those drugs and alcohol. Went back to some of those things. And, and that friend of mine, that, that good friend that I had who was still caught up in that culture, occasionally asked me about the things of God. And I would shy away from a conversation with him about that because I had a desire to use him to still have access to the drugs, to still have access to that way of life, that that old way of life, that letting that flesh come back to life. And, and so when he asked me about the things of God, I would shy away from that conversation, and I wouldn't have that conversation with him. And then there was the night that there came a knock on my door, and I answered the door, and there was a police officer there, and he asked me, do you know Ken? And I was like, yes, I know him. He's a friend of mine. And he looked very grave. And he said, well, he's shot himself, and his parents wanted you to drive them to where he lived because he lived in another town where he was going to school, uh, going to college. And his parents, when they realized what had happened, had thought, who can I have give us a ride there? And they actually looked to me because they looked up to me then because I had been changing in my life some and, and, and on the outside looked pretty good but yet on the inside still had some of those things. And so my wife and I got prepared, and we went, and we got to his parents, and, and the officer said, it doesn't look like he's going to make it. And he had shot himself in the head. And so we went and he got his parents, and we drove the distance to that place. And, and as we drove there, and I thought about the fact that, you know, if he doesn't make it, I never shared the reality of who God was with him. I never, he saw it in my life. He knew there was something different. But I was so selfish and so desirous of continuing and to feed my flesh that I denied him the reality of God. I denied the testimony of the power of God. I denied him eternal life. And if he dies, then his blood is going to be on my hands. Because I was the one that had the influence in his life. I was the one that had helped him turn him on to the drugs in the first place. I, I was the one that was a little bit older and kind of a leader in, in his life and had kind of brought him down that path. And I had the opportunity to bring him out. But I didn't do it. And so we went to the hospital we saw him in the bed there with the, the bandages on his head. And it was a small caliber weapon that he had put to his head and pulled the trigger. And if you know anything about a small caliber, as soon as it enters into the skull, it just bounces around the brain and it just turns the brain into mush, nothing. It, it, it scrambles it like scrambled eggs, just bounces around inside because it can't escape. It's actually worse than a large caliber a lot of times. And so he was brain dead and he was on that bed and I sat there with his parents and with a father that never really showed a lot of love to his son, saying, you know what, I really loved him. Words that maybe he would have liked to have said more when he was alive, but that he shared when he was on his deathbed, ventilator only keeping him alive. And so I went out with anger towards the enemy with a desire 
to not let that happen again. And I went out in the parking lot and I made a commitment to God and said, God, I don't want to have this happen to other people's lives. God, I want to take this experience and I want to, I want to be on fire for you. I want to, I want to experience your, your power. I don't want to let someone else die like this. God, I don't, I don't want to let the enemy gain a victory here. And, and God, I failed Ken. I, I've let him down. There's nothing I can do now for him. But God, I want to, I want to walk in your power and I want to walk in your, your strength. I want to walk in your love and I want to see other people come to know you. I want to, I want to take this circumstance and let it be a catalyst in my life and a foundation that, that I will grow upon and, and, and that I will walk forth in victory and, and bring other people to the Lord and may, may a thousand be raised up out of this experience, God. And I made a commitment to God at that time that I never really followed through on. That although I desired to follow through on it, I've never really followed through on it. And as, and as I shared at the beginning of the message, even though I can flow in the Spirit here when I'm on, on, on the altar, even though, though I can flow in the Spirit when we're praying for people up here and we're, we're asking God to heal and we're asking God to save and we're asking God to provide, and I have no problem with that, I still struggle with flowing in the Spirit when I walk outside these doors. I, I still struggle with flowing in the Spirit when I'm talking to somebody at work. I still struggle with flowing in the spirit when I'm at the grocery store, at the checkout, and just encouraging that young person that's checking me out and saying, you know, hey, God loves you. And, and, and being able to be sensitive enough to what God is doing in my life to take that and share that with someone else. And, and so through this week as I've been looking at that scripture verse, you know, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies. Unless there is that death, it cannot be multiplied into multiple seeds. I want to die here today at this altar. And, and, and I want to say and make afresh again that commitment I had that day when I saw Ken die and, and that I experienced that and say, God, I want to grow in your spirit when I'm outside the doors of this place. God, I don't, I don't want just the reality of you when I'm here. I want to take that reality out there even more so. And it's not that it's not there at all. But I want to have that fullness. I want to be able to say to you that this week I spoke to somebody about God and about the love of God. And, and you know what? Someone was encouraged. You know, I, I want to be able to come and say to you, someone knew God. More because, because of my relationship with him, and I, and I was able to share it to someone. Yeah, yeah. I was able to share with someone, and, and they came to know God. They, they came to, uh, someone asked me, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. And I had the answer. Mm-hmm. And I was ready. I, I, I want to be able to say to you that I was instant in season and out of season. And, and at any point in time, and as God brings those encounters, people will say, hey, I was flowing in the Spirit out there. And so I confess to you my own weakness in that area and, and my own desire because, because I know that you think when you can see me flowing in the Spirit up here that that's the way it is every day all throughout my life. And I want you to know that it's not that way. And I want that to be a word of encouragement to you so that when the enemy comes to you and says, oh, you don't have it like he has it. We all have the power of God. We all have an anointing from God. We all have a gifting from God. We all have the ability to take the love of God out there and share it with others. And that's our responsibility to do. It's not just the minister. And we we can't just say, well, the power of God flows in this place in a powerful way because it does, and say, okay, all we have to do is get him in the door. No. That's great. I mean, that's wonderful. Let's do that. But we need to take that power that's flowing here, out there, and influence the lives out there. And and that's the reality of the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. That's what we are supposed to do as believers. Each and every one of us, take that anointing that's here and spread it out there. And listen, it may not be real strong at first, 
and it may be something you struggle with at first, and that's okay. A little baby struggles with crawling and then struggles with walking and then struggles with running, and before you know it, they come in here and they're running around in circles all over the place. Praise God. But at first, it's a struggle for them. They struggle with talking. They're da ga goo goo and they, they don't know how to say anything. And then they learn how to talk. And then you wonder why you wanted them to talk. <laughs> Praise God. Yes, please, give me a piece and quiet. Oh, thank God for our little kids. And, and, and that is the way it is with us. You know, and as we learn to flow with the Spirit, as we learn to let the power of God move, uh, and as we go outside of this place, baby steps. It's okay. I have to take baby steps. Sue has to take baby steps in areas of her life. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how long you've served the Lord. There's areas we're going to be mature in. There's areas that we're going to be kind of mature in. And there's areas we're going to be immature in. And we all can grow and we all can walk together. And we can all die to our own way of doing things and resurrect in the power of the Spirit. And so, so I, I want there to be a death here today. A death here to self. A death here to the old way of doing things. A death here to uh, business as usual. And, and, and a new life that can come in and power. When, when, when Ken died uh, and they, they took him off the ventilator and stuff, his parents made the decision to donate his organs uh, to help others. And there was six individuals that received various organs from him. And they kept in contact years later with, with some of those individuals. And there was a man that received his heart and got a new lease on life. And, and even his death, even my friend's death, even though I know that he's going to be, spend eternity separated from God. And at his funeral, they had the Grateful Dead records because that was his favorite group. And, and, and it just breaks my heart to know that I had opportunities. There was at least three times I can remember where he asked me about God. And three times that I remember that I did not talk to him about it because I didn't want to interrupt with that relationship I had with him with the drug culture and the, and the pleasing of my flesh. You don't, you, don't know what, you don't know what his relationship was with God when he passed. That's right. That's you right. had influence right. on him. You had influence yeah. on him. He saw the changes. He yeah. was hungry for, for information that you didn't feel comfortable sharing with him. But our God is a gracious and loving and merciful God. And he saw that God in you. And you don't know what happened in that past. Yeah. So and you can rest in peace in knowing that you did have some influence you on him. You planted the seed. You planted the seed. Right. You may not help harvest it, but you planted the seed. You know, well, I would like to be able to say that I was there for the harvest, yeah. you know. Being a Christian doesn't mean that we're holier than now. It means that we're, we're standing here before God and we're saying, God, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. I am broken, but I am forgiven, and I am willing to walk in your life. And I am, you know, I, I, I'm humble before God. Amen. No, you know, don't don't take that responsibility and let it keep you from growing because that's exactly what it's doing. Yeah. You let go of that. You let go of it. It is gone right now. I mean, Jesus, right now, it is gone. You want to die before God right now? You get down on your knees and you say, God, I am here. I am yours. Amen. It is gone. Amen. I relinquish that to you because that is not your responsibility. That's God. Amen. 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 Okay. Okay. And, uh, I accept like it. We say that's that's the toughest thing when you get saved. God's already forgave you. Yep. You got to forgive yourself. Amen. And if you don't forgive yourself, you're disrespecting Jesus that died on that cross for you. Praise you've God. Got to forgive yourself and go on. Yep. You know it's it's. I, I got I got to praying up here Wednesday night, man, and and it got on my heart the terrible things that I did. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus died and shed that blood for me and forgave me. But he didn't always forgive me. The grace of God, he gave me great miracles. Great miracles after he forgave me. Glory. Praise God. You know? The most amazing thing about God is that 
He loved us while we were separated from Him. He loved us while we were deep in sin. But not only that, He knew the mistakes we were going to make, the sins we were going to commit after we gave our lives to Him. And He still called us. He still loved us. He still said, it's okay. The times that we spit in His face and walked away from His love, He knew ahead of time we were going to do that. And He still said, it's okay. I still love you. I still want you. I still pour my spirit out upon you. And you're right. We can't let it be something that holds us back. We can't let it be a bondage. We can't let it be condemnation in our lives. We can use it for commitment. We can use it for conviction, but not condemnation. Because there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The, the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. And it's not a matter of checking off the boxes and this is the right things to do and this is the wrong things to do. It's a matter of letting his spirit come inside of us and life come inside of us in such a powerful way that it changes the way we operate within our lives and it changes the way we experience God in our lives. And, and just like I was saying, you know, there's, there's so many areas in my life where I'd like to see the power of God flow more outside in that workplace. But yet, I see it in people's lives. I know that it is flowing. I know that people's lives are being changed. I know that the seeds are being planted because people will talk to me about things and they'll say things and they'll, they'll mention things that they've seen in my life and I'd be like, well, I don't know how you've seen that because <laughs> I sure haven't experienced it. You know, I don't know how you see me being excited about God because I've been depressed. I've been down. But yet they still see the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, even more so than what you ever will think. Even more so than what you know, people see God in your life. Because God shines. And, and, you know, a flashlight, when you turn a flashlight on and it's shining, the flashlight itself on this back side, it's dark. And it, it doesn't know anything about that light that's shining out of it. And that's the way it is for us from sometimes. You know, the light of the God and the light of the Holy Spirit is shining out of us. And we may not realize it. We may not understand it. We may not see it the, the way everybody else does. But those around us know. And the darker it is, the brighter the light is. And so we could have just a dim little candlelight that's hardly anything. But if you closed all the windows in here and you turned off all the lights, that candle would light up the whole area and you'd be able to see this whole room. And that's the way it is with the power of God. And so even that little light that you have, is more powerful than you think. And, and, and let this message today be a word of encouragement in that, hey, we can die to our old self, we can die to our old ways, we can die to who we used to be, and we can resurrect again in newness in life, and we can experience the power of God to walk forth out of this place. And, and I know the power of God is so powerful here, and, and the reason I wanted to share this message is because, you know, last week the power of God was here so mightily, and the anointing was here so powerfully, and we talked about the anointing, we talked about the power, we talked about the things that God's planning on doing in this area and you know, through this church. And I want to encourage you that, that it's not just what's happening here, but it's our everyday life. And, and I wanted to let you know that just in the same way that you may struggle in areas outside of this place in, in sharing God. Some of you may be really good about it and, and have led many people to the Lord. But I know there's people here that have had struggles with that. I know there's people here that, that are intimidated and shy when it comes to sharing the Word of God with others. And I want you to know that it's something that we all struggle with. But the greatest thing that we can do is to testify to what God has done in our lives. To share the reality of God in our hearts, to just take what is real. We don't have to memorize a bunch of scriptures. It's good to memorize scriptures. We don't have to memorize a certain formula. It can be good to know some of these things, but we just share what God's done for me, what God's done. That's why we are witnesses to the power of God, that we, we go out and we share the reality of what he's done in our lives. And, and no one can deny that. You, people can deny the scripture. They can deny history. They can deny all kinds of truths. But they cannot deny what has happened in your life. And they cannot teach you any differently because you know because you've lived it. Amen. And you can bear witness to what God has done for you. You can bear witness to what God has done 
to you. You can bear witness to what God has spoken to you and to your heart, and you can share that. And that is where the boldness comes from as you just gradually and slowly and methodically share with someone what God's done for you this week, what God's done for you today, well, how God has given you life and breath. I was thinking about it the other day, man, the fact that I'm able to breathe. Oh, thank God for air. Thank God for oxygen. And I get enough oxygen out of the air. I don't have to have a tank of oxygen. I see people with a tank of oxygen. There are people that have to be on breathing machines. Thank God, just just be able to breathe. Thank God for that power that he's given me to breathe. Thank God that that my heart pumps and I don't have to have a pacemaker, that that it's functioning and 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 it's working and and the blood is flowing through my body and, and, and it's getting where it needs to go. No, I'm not as healthy as I could be or I probably should be, but thank God for the health I do have. Thank God for the strength I do have. Thank God that I, you know, I have both my legs and I can walk, you know, and and, and I have pains and, and different things that, you know, sometimes slow me down. But, man, thank God that I have something that can hurt. Thank God for the things that he's given me. And thank God that we can be a witness onto what he has done in our lives and, and through us and to us. Thank God that we can take that and that we can all grow and know that, no matter, whenever we look at someone else and we see them mature in one area, listen, there's another area they're not mature in. And don't be discouraged just because you see someone else that's more mature in an area. As a matter of fact, go alongside them and let them mentor you and help you. And if you're mature in an area, mentor somebody else. Take someone else under your wing. Take somebody that isn't as mature and encourage them and strengthen them and bring them up. Remember, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And, and I believe it works that way within the body, too. We're only as strong as our weakest member. And that is why we talked about last week, we need to strengthen one another. We need to love one another. We need to encourage one another. We need to all the more, it said, as we see the day approaching and the day is definitely approaching. The time is near. The Lord is coming back soon. And how much more should we spur one another on toward more maturity and encourage one another and say, listen, I'm weak in areas too. Just because you see me strong in this area doesn't mean there isn't areas I'm weak in. And we need to be honest about it. Confess our sins and to one another. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Be honest about our weakness because when we are weak, he is strong. And humble ourselves before the Lord and not walk in arrogance and pride as the manner of some are, but to be humble. And so I humble myself before you today and say, hey, I'm working on it just as much as you are. And just because you can see me flow in the spirit in this place doesn't mean that it's all that easy for me to do it out there. And, and, and for you, you may flow easily out there, but you need to have, be strengthened and learn how to flow in here. I, I love to see the time where we have the altar time at the end of the service and see the gifts flowing in, 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 the, in this altar time and, and at the altar and, and, and see the power of God and the gifts flow and the miracles flow and the, and the prophecy flow and the words of encouragement. And, and I know there's been some here that have even said, you know, I normally don't do this, but they felt God, you know, lay on their heart a scripture verse and they come and share it with someone. Praise God. I'm excited when I see that happening. And yeah, it's okay if you don't normally do that, but you feel God encouraging you to share a scripture verse, share it. You know, you, you feel God I- encouraging you to to share a word of encouragement, share it. And, and you'll know if it's encouraging, if it's uplifting, if it's uh, leading people to God's spirit, then you know it's from God. If it's discouraging, if it's condemning, if it's judgmental, you can keep yourself quiet about that one because that's not coming from God. God will encourage. God will lift up. God will, will uh, bring strength to the body. Hallelujah. And Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy in this place and the power of your spirit that flows in this place. And, and Father, I thank you, Lord, that, that as a, a kernel of wheat dies in the ground and then it multiplies into multiple seeds, that, Lord, there will just be a time of, of 
of death and life in this place, dear God, that as we continually die to ourselves, continually die to the flesh, continually die to, the, to our own ways of thinking, that that new life will come into us, those new thoughts will come into us, that, that, God, we will bring into captivity every thought that exalts itself against you, God, and that we will submit our thought life to you, that we will submit our, our words to you, that we will submit our walk to you. And, Lord, this week, may this community and this area and these counties around here be changed by your power that is flowing out of this place. Let us come into this place and experience the flow of your spirit and let us go out of this place in that flow of the spirit and let us share that anointing that comes from you throughout our daily lives. And then, Lord, if it's just in a small way, let it be in a small way, but let us acknowledge that it's you. Let us acknowledge that that we are changing. Let us acknowledge that there is new life. And just as a seed begins small, let it begin small and let it grow into the tree that it can become. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.